Hello, and welcome to Roleplay Radio Sci-Fi Edition. Fear not, your beloved DM Alex isn't far. He and the others will be playing Space Pirates, an adventure run by yours truly, Rin Garnett. This mini-series takes place in the Talos Sector, my custom setting for the sci-fi game Stars Without Number. For a free version of the rulebook, head to drivethroughrpg.com. For more info on the setting, Google Wow, That's a Lot of Stars to find my World Anvil page. Now, without further ado, a perfectly normal day on board the Dragon's Daughter. It's time for How to Pirate Space. It is the year 3211. You are all native inhabitants of some region or another of the Talos sector. Until three years ago, this sector had 10 planets, not all of which inhabited. Then three years ago, something changed. A warning went out across the sector, telling everyone about the Emerald Legion. These people, It's a very militant group. They have been infiltrating various areas, both in government and civilian, in order to make various planets in the sector easier for them to take over. And they attempted to do so three years ago, with three battleships orbiting one particular little known planet called Talmar. They were defeated, and this warning went out by the victors of this war, known as the Night Knights, to tell everyone else of what was going on. Since then, the Talos Sector has gained two planets. Talmar has officially joined the Protectorate Alliance, but the Twelfth Planet has not, and for all intents and purposes cannot. The planet of Rada is entirely under Emerald Legion control and has been for decades. And since the Emerald Legion is effectively the planetary government, and the planetary government is what needs to decide if they join an alliance, Rada is not part of this alliance, and the natives there receive no help. No official help from any governing body. As pirates, you all have likely had some skirmishes, perhaps, with the occasional Emerald Legion fighter. But otherwise, aside from the ensuing paranoia that has gripped me, you haven't noticed any major changes. The most concerning is that you do know the Emerald Legion does occasionally abduct civilians and implant a brain chip to make them an unwilling and unknowing sleeper agent, but that seems pretty unlikely. <laughs> That's why it was mentioned, because it's really unlikely, yeah, you know? We have, we have no memories of this happening. No Manchurian yeah. candidates. It doesn't happen frequently, because if it did, it would be much easier for people to notice. And thus, it is kept infrequent, and the memories of the abductee are modified, so even they don't know it happened. <laughs> so, you all are space pirates. Crew members on board the Dragon's Daughter 6, captained by Captain Hawk. Yes! <laughs> <laughs> I mentioned every time you say Captain Hawk, the sound of a hawk in the background goes. <laughs> 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 He's one of the more well-known pirate captains. He has a reputation not just among pirates, but also among the average person. He has a webcomic about him. I owned a digital collection myself. It is not very well drawn, but it is very consistently updated and has been consistently updated for several years. It's done by him? Nobody knows. Oh. I want it to be him, like like he's up at night, he should be in bed, but he's making his comic books about himself. I'm not saying he doesn't. I'm saying I believe the author's name is C. Hawkinson. <laughs> I think was the decision. We don't know a Hawkinson on this crew. Yeah, yeah it's true. It's true. Mm-hmm. Nothing to jump to conclusions about. I need to make a Captain Hawk theme song now, by the way. Uh, <laughs> yes, please. Captain Absolutely. Hawk! So, at the moment, you are all on board this ship. You have recently departed Mythoris, which 
is the most populated, populous planet in the sector. Most well known for housing the sector's only preceptor archive, a massive library containing information dating back to Earth. We are here or we're leaving? You have recently left there. That was your last report. At the moment, you are in metadimensional space as your ship is partaking on a spike drill to your destination. You are a few days in and you have days left on your journey. Your destination is a point in space between the co-orbiting planets of Livonia and Janus. These two planets have been at war with each other for ages, and these space battles often leave valuable salvage for those who know where to find it. And your captain seems to have gotten a tip about where the space battle will soon be happening, so you can be first on the scene. But at the moment, you are just cruising through metadimensional space. Outside viewports, you just see the inky black rainbows of metadimensional space. As evocative as I'm trying to figure out how that works. The idea is oil, how it mm. has like the different colors, but Ooh. it's black. Cool. That's their version of the Astral Sea. I don't know what the Astral Sea is, but metadimensional space is a higher order continuum that is used for effectively faster than light travel that is non-Euclidean space. So places that are very, very close via metadimensional space might be on complete opposite ends of the galaxy. And you get there because it's made of oil, so slick. Yes, no exactly. Yep. <laughs> her, her the book, nobody actually knows how it works. That's the best explanation. Yes. <laughs> so do you need, is it like the deep sea where you need light to see something or are you guided by so, something? So, I love this. In order to traverse metadimensional space, you need effectively a map. These are called rudders. Once you have a rudder from one point to another point, a skilled pilot can follow that rudder in what's called a spike drill. Spike drills, depending on the speed of the ship and how far you're going, can take a week or more. There's a lot that can go wrong. You need at least one pilot at the helm at all times. And thus, pilots have been in rotation on the ship. One pilot will man the helm for four or so hours before trading off with another. Michael, your yes. character is one such pilot. Now, this shift is going to be very special for you, as it is the first one since you've joined this crew that you will be the primary pilot, and another one will just be shadowing you. About that time, honestly. Yeah, exactly. So it is very exciting for you. Would you like to introduce your character and tell us what your character would be doing an hour or so before heading to the cockpit? So my character is named uh, Rami Ramani. He was previously in line to be a head engineer on a ocean planet called Torm, where people live on giant turtles. But that's a lifetime posting, and he was not into that idea, so he ran away from that and the arranged marriage it came with <laughs> to join up with a research group on a different planet called Kuwait, where an immediate workplace accident turns him into essentially a slave for oh. them as they paid for his medical bills and then held that against him and garnished his wages for quite some time. At one point, a pirate ship came into the mining facility that he was working at and raided it for materials and he just kind of tagged along with them since then. Rami is a frailer looking person. He's very skinny, does not look healthy, and part of this is partially because his medical implants aren't playing well with him. One of his eyes has been replaced with a robotic dim red glow kind of uh, pupil, and one of his legs is also mechanical. And I think that as we're coming away from the Preceptor Archive, Rami is a huge book nerd in that he's probably one of the most technically educated people that he is on this ship, and so he was trying to find any not books. What are they called in this setting? It could be books. You could also effectively have a comm pad that has a particular yeah. book. Hollow books. Hollow book? Yeah, yeah that sounds good. Cool. Um, <laughs> so he's got a big stack of hollow books piled up on his desk that he's going through from various different compiled texts from the archive that he bought while he was on Mithoris. 
Yeah, especially because while in meta-dimensional space, you are cut off from any other internet-like communications. Yeah. You are left with whatever is on the ship. So you are in your cabin? In the cabin, reading through that, and there is a little radio that's playing lo-fi beats to chill and study <laughs> to in the corner. You are not alone in your cabin. Near you is one of your cabin mates. Each cabin has four bunks, and two of your cabin mates aren't here. The third is also at his desk, hunched over a paper journal furiously writing away. Every now and then you hear him kind of sniffle and stifle a sob. If you turn your radio down at all, you can faintly hear very sad, sappy music coming from his headphones. I'll turn it all the way up <laughs> to try to tune him out. He looks very distressed as he continues writing. Eventually, Rami gets too distracted by this and clicks shut the um, hollow book, turns down the radio, and goes over to this person. Do I know their name? Yes. This is Craig. Craig. Yes. Cool. Craig. And Craig, you would probably also know, is an engineer. Hmm. Great. Not as good as me. Um, <laughs> so I'll just like go over to Craig and just tap him on the shoulder. You startle him out of his seat and he drops his pen on the ground. He just stares at it very dejectedly and just slouches in his chair. <laughs> hey, uh, Craig, first of all, Inside Out Mystery Peels, good choice. Um, <laughs> second of all, you're kind of breathing my vibe, and I'm about to go do a spike drill shift, so... Your vibe? Yes, my vibe. My vibe is dead. <laughs> yeah, well, everything dies eventually. <laughs> my life is over. Uh-huh. My heart has become solid, like steel, like silver, <laughs> and cold. Craig, what was her name this time? Hmm. <laughs> I heard, I was told, that my queen's heart has been taken by another. Uh-huh. Is she on the ship? Or is this just another one of the, the girls that you met online? He flips his journal back a couple pages, and you <laughs> see an entire page filled with the name Brady, who <laughs> you would know is first mate on this ship, second in command to the captain himself. And her name is written in bubble letters and block letters and cursive, very like hard sketched, like on the side, upside down, backwards, just covering this page. I've been told that she has chosen another, that pilot. Which one? Aleem. And you would know Aleem is the one piloting right now who's supposed to shadow you in an hour. No good. The the cool one with the <laughs> oh, no. dashing looks. He's and the cool one. The suave words. And I'm just Craig. Nothing. Oh no. No no, no 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 no. You're not just Craig. You're Craig. No who... one at all. Listen, Craig. Nobody can fault you for not taking big swings at the very least. So, um, good on you for that, and yeah, Rami will just pat him on the back and say, I'm gonna go you somewhere less You were about sad. to say that when something else happens. Okay. But we'll get back to that. <laughs> Pilot, your character happens to have the day off today. Everyone is on different cycles. Everyone works different shifts. Day and night doesn't really matter. While in meta-dimensional space, you happen to have some free time today. What would you be doing? Making my favorite dish of a, uh, a veal carbonara. Mmm. <laughs> so you are in the kitchen, the in the secret, galley. The secret is a little bit of not make. <laughs> Getting veal in meta-dimensional space must be a <laughs> vacuum sealed <laughs> a challenge. Well, we we call it veal. That's I mean that's what they want you to think it's veal. Mm. <laughs> Rehydrated veal. <laughs> so you are you are in the galley. 
It is between normal meal times. It is approaching like the next standard meal time. So you have a little bit of time to use the kitchen by yourself before the rest of the cooking crew comes in for the next big meal for everyone else. And someone else walks in, a cook who's here a little bit early and you recognize this young woman. She is uh, one of your cowmates and she is also an assistant cook. So she comes in, she's humming a song and she sees you there and immediately her face lights up. She's like, oh, All right, come hey, here before you Rumi? say anything. You just want to put this in your face. You okay, to... great. Can you roll 2d6 for me? I also need to know Tyler's character name from my notes. Sid. Nigel. Sid Nigel. Alright, so that's eight. What is your dexterity modifier? The answer is very good. Um, zero, because it's, it's a ten, so it's zero. Yep. She has a bite and thinks about it. Not bad. What's wrong? It's not bad. <laughs> it's just the nutmeg, isn't it? I put too much in. Maybe, maybe that's it. Yeah. Um, I've got to throw the whole thing out. Anyway, so I was thinking. Uh -huh. So I keep calling you my roomie. Yeah, you do. But then I thought, well, wait, we don't, we don't have rooms. We have cabins, so we're not roommates. We're cabin mates. And then I thought, wait, wait, wait. That would mean I'd call you a cabbie, and that's weird because we don't drive taxis. That'd be like really lame. Who wants to drive a taxi? <laughs> So then I thought, well, what's another way to abbreviate cabin mate? Matey. <laughs> Can it be matey? Because we're pirates? You're all too much nutmeg. <laughs> <laughs> it's too much nutmeg. Anyway, I, I came to just start cooking early. I am loving being on this ship. This is just so much fun. Leaving that school was the best decision I've ever made. You know what? Just yesterday, I saw someone, I think, he was doing a little bit of matchmaking. So I gave him a little bit of a hint. Cause like, he was really eyeing that grumpy lady who's always around the captain. <laughs> so I told him, you know what? I bet if you're trying to set her up with someone, go for that pilot. You know the really cool one? Sure. Uh, and his face just lit up. Oh, it was like he was struck by lightning. I really can't <laughs> wait to see where that goes. Well, I uh, wish you the best in your machinations. And uh, would you mind taking a step to the, uh, the left there? I want to get the nutmeg. Uh, oh, yeah, sure. <laughs> and she, she scoots to the side, snaps on the gloves, and just grabs a knife set and flips a knife in the air and just starts cutting away. The most surprising thing about Vienna is that despite her seeming incompetence with pretty much everything, she has incredible knife skill. And she has only just joined this crew at Mithoris. But you are heading out of the room? Or are you heading for the nutmeg? I'll draw an to the nutmeg. And you know, you scoot around her, you put your hand on the nutmeg, and as soon as you do... Up behind! Uh, we'll get to what happens in a second. Nikki! Me! <laughs> How's it going? Depends, what am I doing? Uh-oh. You're killing a guy. You're in the middle of killing someone. <laughs> you... On the ship in metadimensional space, dang. That's a murder mystery right there. Yeah. <clears throat> so, you work comms. Yep. Primarily. Yep. And during a spike drill, that's that's kind of boring. Yeah. There's not a lot of communicating going on aside from internal stuff. So it's mostly monitoring systems and telling engineering if something doesn't look right. Not terribly thrilling, but you have ended your comm shift for the day. Where would you be heading? Is there... So in my backstory, I'd said that Jay had figured out a way to be able to turn off gravity in just one mm -hmm. room of a ship. Has Jay been able to do that anywhere on this ship? Why don't you roll me a fix? Yeah, that sounds like a fix. Hey, right. I'm good at these. 2d6 is... Hey, <laughs> that's two sixes. <laughs> yes. I think you have been able to do this 
where? So typically Jay would want to do this in like a somewhat open, not super used room. Because mm -hmm. obviously if you turn the gravity off in like the cargo bay, all the shit like moves <laughs> yep, around. Yep, yep. Ship has like standard stuff like kitchen, probably a few common rooms. So probably it would be like one of the smaller common rooms to not kind of get in everybody's way, but also have enough space yeah. that anti-gravity is fun. Yeah. So this is a Corvette, which I believe max crew is 50. Okay. And this is probably about 40 people. I said 50 with a question mark because I'm going off of memory because I forgot to double check that stat. Yeah. A lot of people are working in various ways. A lot of people are heading to mess hall for dinner or lunch or breakfast. Yep. Insert meal here. And you are heading to just this little side room. Yep. But on the way there, you are accosted. Oh, okay. You haven't had your chill time. You just had a long, boring day of work. Probably was doing a lot of chilling even during work. Yep. <laughs> and you hear behind you, you. As you turn around, you see one of your cabin mates, a woman named Ishel. Okay. She as always has her hair pulled so taut in a bun that it's drawing her eyebrows back <laughs> and she marches towards you and just points a finger directly in your face just point a finger back at her <laughs> like <laughs> et you <laughs> left a happy and sandwich in the cabin <laughs> yeah that sounds like me <laughs> it attracted rats that left slime all over my clothes. Dang. Then <gasps> fuck that one up. Yeah, those were the clothes I was supposed to wear today, and I had to bring them down to laundry to get it fixed. Do you know how infuriating that is? To go down to laundry? Do you need to borrow any of my clothes? No, I don't need to borrow your gross wrinkly clothes. For the record, Jay exclusively wears like very comfy clothes. So I'm thinking like she's currently just wearing a jumpsuit thing. It's not fashionable. Yep. Like you, a gas attendant jumpsuit? Probably like stretchier than that. So it's even comfier. Like sweatpants material? Yeah, like sweatpants material. Are as you a wearing jumpsuit. a onesie? <laughs> <laughs> I think it's a, a sleeveless onesie, but yeah, it's a onesie. Yes. With Crocs. Oh. It's with Crocs. Crocs have survived. <laughs> Maximum comfort, Jay. Yeah. <laughs> Whereas Dichel is all like tailor refined, pressed and ironed, pristine clothing. And she is infuriated with you in this moment. I cannot stand for this. You need to clean up your act or be thrown off the ship. Um, I mean, I've been here for like, hang on, um, <laughs> oh, five years. I don't care. You are inviting rodents into our sleeping spaces. What if they eat your eyes? Do they do that? I didn't Wait. download any vids about whether rats eat your eyes or not. I can't check until we're out of med dimensional space. <laughs> you know what? I'm just, I'm gonna go file a complaint. Okay, bye. <laughs> and as she, as she walks away, something happens. Ooh. That we will get back to. All right, uh, so I've been referring to my character as Jay because that is like her truest name. She would have introduced herself to anybody on this ship as Juliet. If you don't know her particularly well, you would probably call her Juliet. If you are good friends with her, you might call her Jay. Her backstory is that she grew up on pirate ships, like her mother was a pirate, and she just kept swapping identities from ship to ship and changing names from ship to ship. But also she didn't try very hard, so even though she's been a pirate her whole life, she's not like that good at it. <laughs> but she swapped between different names, like Julie. You, they, they, I, are yes, so they are all J names. They are all J names. <laughs> but they do like vary in gender. So if for whatever reason I'm talking about her past and I use he pronouns or they <laughs> pronouns, that's why. Gender fluid. Yeah. But like, eh, at least last five years, she's a woman. Yeah. Gender fluid or gender meh? 
I think Ginger Ginger Man. Man. Yeah, I like that It's one. just like, oh yeah, okay, I'm You here. ship knew me. Uh, yeah. Yes. She is about five foot ten, relatively skinny with like a little bit of muscle, and she's got long brown hair. Was probably shorter when she started on the ship, but she's been here five years, it got long. <laughs> Tyler, would you like to describe? My introduction would make most sense after Alex. Alright. Okay. Yes. So Alex. Yes. You don't have any particular skills that make you exceptionally helpful <laughs> in metadimensional space on a ship, which is sort of how it goes for Scions. And I'm in a general. people person. Yeah. <clears throat> when it comes time for just general ship tending, you tend to fill in wherever help is needed, and lately that has been aiding with provisions, namely, you're assisting with laundry. <laughs> <laughs> you are currently on your lunch break. Presumably, feel free to interrupt me if you think any of this is not correct. You're in the mess hall, and you see a colleague that you know. You see Gavril. He is a provisioner. You work with him. He is familiar to you, and he is just sitting, eating by himself. Hmm. And being your sociable self, that seems like someone that you would go up and talk to. That is an invitation. Mm -hmm. And as you go with your food and sit next to him, he looks decidedly unhappy to see you. Oh. So uh, I think John Louis brings over his tray, sits down, and says, like, Gavril, just the man I wanted to see. What do you want? Well, nothing in particular. I just came over to say hi, just got off laundry duty. You know, it's, it's really good to take care of your appearance when you're out there pirating. Yeah. Great. Could, could you just not talk to someone else instead? And hygiene. Hygiene is very important and I, I can't help but notice... Gabriel. Could you kindly fuck off? No. <laughs> okay. Let me just leave you with uh, this I'm here. I'm just really sick of you scions <clears throat> thinking you own the place. Gavril. Can't you just accept the man wants to eat by himself? Gavril. <laughs> First of all, I do not own this place, Captain Hawk owns it. Everybody knows that. I just... What did I do to you? If, if, if I... Pardon me if I insulted you in any way, shape, or form, I pride myself in being better than I was yesterday. You insult me by existing. Oh. Oh. I see. That's why I left Zeros. Sick of all your scions. <sighs> You know, Gav, his tone then changes. <laughs> I have been nothing but polite to you, Gav. And your hostility, it's going to get you into a lot of trouble, Gav. As a gentleman, I will leave you alone and respect your wishes. But please, don't insult science like that in my presence again. Kindly, thank you. He just waves you off. Mm. Completely uninterested in anything you have to say and goes back to his meal. Damn, that hurt. <laughs> he's still gonna be kind and he's going to write in the napkin his room number says, I'm throwing blackjack night, you're invited. <laughs> and just like slide it over without saying anything. Yeah. And you know, working with him, he's fine to work with. He doesn't treat you poorly. He's technically your superior, mm. but he just really doesn't want anything to do with you. You hand this note over to Gabriel. He takes it and asks, you asking for drugs for this? <laughs> if, if you if you are just stop by the office. I wasn't, but I let my friends know, maybe. Most of them probably already know. And he slides a paper back to you. And in that moment, something happens. My character's name is Juan Luis Cofresi, but everyone calls him John Louis. And it's okay, he actually likes John Louis better. But don't tell his mama that he said that or it would break her heart. Juan Luis is a perfectly elegant name, but it's a nobleman's name. And John Louis is not a noble anymore. He's a pirate, a scoundrel, a thief. He's from Astronius, the dying planet, uh, left about three years ago and has been pirating ever since, living the life of adventure that he always dreamed of, stealing from the powers that be and giving back to the lesser fortunate. And he wants to just keep doing that for the rest of his life. 
Uh, he's 27-ish. Kind until you mess with him or insult him and his friends, then can flip like a switch. Handsome, and his piratey attribute is that he has fake teeth, but mm. because there's cybernetics in this world, these are very fucking fancy fake teeth. And every time he smiles, they sparkle. <laughs> And for added context, Astronius being a dying planet is because the sun it orbits is at the end of its life. It is expanding into a red giant. It will eventually completely consume the planet. It hasn't gotten there yet, but the planet is unbearably hot. It is incredibly difficult to survive there. And though there are still some people who are insisting that they will stay there, mass evacuations have been taking place for years. All right, uh, the name's Sid Nigel, former strongman wrestler. Pissed off the wrong booker. Had to start over, got black bold. <laughs> this uh, John Louis kid, he came to all the shows when he was a small tyke. I started a, a, a bodyguard business and the word is now this little lad. Came over to me, showed me this picture he took with me and his old lady, Holly Mom. And, uh, Oh, Bob's your uncle. Don't hire at me, and I'm uh, attached to him for like the last, uh, well, God. How long now? Three years, actually. It seems like ten. Yeah. Going from fan to friend has been just a dream. I'm sure it's, uh, the pleasure's all yours. But he's alright. Locks my cooking. The wrestling organization, can that be called the GGE or the Galactic Grappling Entertainment? Ooh, <laughs> I like it. Yes. All across the ship, this very second, the lights dim, the sirens go off, warning lights start flashing, an announcement airs, and an automated voice saying, Warning, warning, metadimensional storm incoming, warning, evasive action required. And after a few seconds of silence, that repeats, now, metadimensional storms are a risk in space, but the pilot is meant to be averting those. That's the point of having a pilot at the helm during a drill. And you hear, all of you, this alarm go off. Yeah, no, I think Rami hears this and is immediately like, oh, the other guy must have fucked up. <laughs> um, and he's gonna start running for the helm. All right. Is anyone else heading to the cockpit? And they got a pure curiosity. Just like, oh, what's going on here? John Louis' instinct would be to seek out Sid for backup. But I don't know if he would know that you were eating, so... I mean, more than like. Now, for what it's worth, you're in the mess, he's in the galley. Is that close by? Yeah. The galley's the kitchen. Okay. If you're in the mess, that's that's where the food is served. So they're typically yeah, yeah. right next to that each makes other. Sense. I'm so... gonna run to seek out Sid. So, you are heading to the cockpit. Two of you are. Yep. Everyone starts running around trying to figure out what is going on. You two happen to be the first ones to the cockpit. The locations where you were happened to be close enough that you were the first ones there. You two, are you just staying roughly in the dining area? Other people are heading to other stations, engineering's heading to check on the engines. Well, you know, I don't mean to be rude, but I was I was talking about getting some of the, the nutmeg. You can absolutely just <laughs> continue your cooking if that is what you Didn't would you like to do. Too much nutmeg. Yeah, I would... but I have to make it again and pair it back. Oh, I see. I, I think John Louis would try to rally Sid, so I think he, we would see him running into the galley and just be, hey, Sid, my friend, something's going on. I think they might need us over at the cockpit. Something is going on, yeah. I'm finding out the secrets to the <sighs> nutmeg and the carbon. Oh, this smells yeah, delicious. Let's try this out. It's the I cream bait. In the come on, hey, come on. Um, yeah, that's nice, let it simmer. <laughs> that is really good. Let's I walk can't, and talk. You can't rush this. You know what? You're on the clock. The walk and talk. Warning. That's Warning. not fair. Metadimensional storm imminent. <laughs> All right. He takes, you know, he throws down his wooden spoon, takes off his oven mitts, <laughs> un undoes, oh, undoes his very nice bespoke apron with his name embroidered on there. Does he wear anything underneath the apron? He's completely nude. Is that what you're asking? No, I was asking if he have a shirt on. He is... Damn. Okay, he looks <laughs> he looks like Hagar from Streets of Rage. 
He's shirtless with pants and suspenders. Cool. If he's wearing a shirt, then he's wearing like an A tank top. Is he like big? Yeah, okay. He's big, big and muscly. Yeah. He's huge. So, so you're you're taking your sweet ass time. You two get there pretty quickly and encounter each other right outside the cockpit doors. Can I do a thing? Uh. Yeah, sure, if you want. Hey, Aleem! And I'm gonna like smack on the door to try to get it to open up. Yeah, I mean, the door will open. It's not okay. locked. What are you doing? Oh, right, sorry, I was checking the, uh, the system report on the stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Can I, uh, like, I would assume that with my compad could access ship system reports. Yeah, sure. All systems are green aside from this warning. There's nothing that's malfunctioning. You see that sort of dashboard on your compad as the sliding door slides open and Ami at least rushes in. Yes. And you see Aleem hunched over the helm with a knife in his back. Okay, uh, I think Rami is going <laughs> immediately went up to like grab him and be like, hey, what's going on? And then his body just kind yeah. of slumps. Ah! Uh, oh, fuck. All good over there? Alex, are you reacting to us or are you reacting to something there? Okay, cool. <laughs> All right, the gasp from the kitchen was, oh, fuck, the pilot's dead. <laughs> is he like dead, dead? Oh, he is dead. Dead's okay. dead, baby. Not, not savable dead. No, he, okay. he uh, even as you like touch his body, it is cold. Well, it's been a while then. Yeah. <laughs> You know it's been no more than four hours. <laughs> <laughs> okay, no, t no, no time to deal with this right now. Here, grab him, <laughs> and I'm gonna like okay. try to scooch him out of the chair and then get in. Yep. I've dragged dead people around before. This is fine. <laughs> <laughs> and as you as you push him over, <laughs> pirate her whole life. What do you expect? You're right. You're right. <laughs> and a bio scion, so like. Yeah. You know. And do you think people don't just die on pirate ships sometimes? No, they're safe. Forever, because they have their oranges and there's no scurvy. Uh, as as the body slumps, you kind of pull it to the side. You notice the lips are blue, and there's like a bit of like blue foam around his mouth. Damn. <laughs> I don't know how I like look at this. <laughs> are you okay, Tyler? It's, I don't know I don't, why this has brought giggles. This is it's just the underwhelmed nature <laughs> of your character to the horrificness. Your last two statements have been one word of damn. Fuck. <laughs> Lifelong pirate, baby. Yeah, okay, we gotta yeah, go in his back. <laughs> so, as Jay is dragging the body away, Rami takes control of the helm to try and avert disaster. Can you please roll me a pilot check? I can do that. Thirteen. <sighs> nice. You are too close to the storm to entirely avoid it, even with your skill but you do avoid complete disaster as you skirt around the outside of this whirling maelstrom of metadimensional energies. It pulls your ship through space and through time and just spits you out somewhere completely different at the same velocity that you were already heading. You need a spike drill. Normally, you exit a spike drill at the edge of a system because that is safest. But this storm spits you out nearly in orbit of a planet. With all of your abilities, you are able to fairly closely, safely <laughs> direct the ship into the atmosphere of this planet. Now, at this point, even Jay can see several systems are failing. The entire ship shuddered as it hit this storm with metadimensional energies lashing around it. And as you are hurling through the atmosphere of some unknown planet, there are alarms going off everywhere. Several systems are showing up in red and concerned. Down the hall, the remaining two members of the party can hear people shouting down in engineering as you are running toward the cockpit. Other people are running other places. Others are just trying to grab onto the side as the whole ship shakes. The ship descends faster and faster as you careen into a valley, snapping trees as you go and settle onto lush mud. You feel the ship kind of sink and list to one side. You've landed. 
You've survived. You've avoided catastrophe. But all the lights are off. Hey, good job, man. You did the thing. <laughs> Rami was about to say something clever, and then you said that. <laughs> and he just looks over here. Th thank you. Yeah, anytime. <laughs> At this time, a tall woman with side of her head shaved and her hair flipped over to the other, revealing all sorts of tattoos across her scalp, just storms into the room you recognize first mate, Brady. She's like, the fuck is going on? Uh, oh, this guy's dead. Yep. <laughs> I got us um, far away from the storm as I could on short notice. Fan-fucking-tastic. And our last two members saunter over. <laughs> At last. <laughs> the first thing John Louis notices is the body. <laughs> and he just holds back some vomit and then just goes, in the nombre de la madre de las estrellas, he will have a proper burial. We will notify his next of king. Got to check what are you talking about? Oh, we should check if the atmosphere is breathable before we start dealing with that. See, help me carry the Well, uh, I think no... our captain has already decided that. And she points out and Captain Hawk is just outside, walking around, and you oh, see this tall, wide man dressed in like full stereotypical pirate regalia. This lush red coat with coattails and everything, these black cuffed boots with a bit of a heel to them. He has this gorgeous multicolored parrot on his shoulder with its long tail feathers reaching halfway down Captain Hawk's back. You at the moment only see the back of him, but you know just by knowing the man, he is stroking his long, gorgeous black beard as he is looking around the space. Not wearing a helmet of any no, kind or any is, space suit? No. Nope. Yep, this makes sense. He's, he's just out there. He turns back to the cockpit where you all are looking, and he just motions to come out. And Brady turns to look at the rest of you and says, You heard him? Well, if it's a slow poison, we'll die together. I can cure slow poison, it's fine. Gather the rest of the crew on your way out, I'll deal with this. Is, is no one going to help me bury the young pilot? I said I'll deal with it. It's all right, lad, we're going to notice him the captain. Do I have signal? No. Damn. I'll go grab my outdoors kit before mm -hmm. heading out. Yeah. Now, the ship is sideways. Um, <laughs> not, you know, entirely, but it is somewhat sideways. You're not the first ones outside. There are some others who've made it there before you. The ship's physician, for instance, other people doing atmosphere tests, confirming it seems fine. The area you're in is very lush. You're in a valley. There are mountains on all sides of you. There are tall trees around the area with these huge leaves that start indigo and fade out to a lighter blue. Even the grass is faintly teal. It's a little chilly. Seems to be evening. As the ship's inhabitants make their way outside. What are you doing in this time? How are you coping? <laughs> <laughs> Sid's trailing behind the lead, and he's just uh, kind of thumbing through, I guess we'll be like a, a reader's digest. He's trying to find better things for like a carbonara. Carbonara. He's working on how to say that too. <laughs> <laughs> Sid, uh? you know what people need during times of great stress? Probably a lot of relaxation, yes. probably some comfort from friends and family. A hug or two, but that probably wouldn't hurt. Sid, you uh, are as wise as you are strong. Uh, yes, exactly. Some relaxation, some de-stressing, some mood lifters. I mean, hell, the last two people that I've talked to have growled at me, basically. So uh, I'm going to rally up some people. We're going to have a blackjack night right here, right now. What say you? Hope you brought the table. <laughs> Uh, Rami says as he's just like walking past in the background. You're invited, kind pilot. Rami. I mean, I imagine we'll get orders soon, but... Well, in the meantime, we'll find a log and, uh... Hey, you! You over there! Mm -hmm. The one smoking! 
Air seems breathable enough. Also, <laughs> I am braiding this plant into my hair. It looks lovely. Thank you. Your name was Juliet, right? Yeah. Like the drug. Heck yeah. For context. <laughs> Juliet is a drug that will instill a near-death state in whomever takes it. It is a last-ditch effort to stop or slow the progression of a disease or illness to bide time for better medical treatment. But it is very dangerous, as not everyone can come out of it fully intact, and it is illegal to get in most places, aside from very specific medical circumstances. Please respond. I can't say that I am a smoker, but there's a first time for everything. Until we get orders, come join Blackjack, and maybe we can <laughs> pass the joint, as people say. Oh yeah, sure, here. <gasps> oh, that was quick. Um, <laughs> you know what? <laughs> sure. You're still on the clock. <laughs> In case I faint. Oh, you, it goes the other way here. Well, apparently I'm on the clock, so uh, no, no thanks. I'll take some. Yeah, nice. <laughs> and John Louis just starts dealing out cards. All right. As you're doing that, other crew members are setting up other stations. The physicians have gotten a little medical area set up to tend to any wounds that people sustained. It was a fairly smooth crash landing as far as crash landings go, but there are a couple people who like hit their heads. You see Vienna who has like a cut on her hand because she was cutting vegetables at the time. You will note there are like no engineers out here, presumably because they're all working on the ship. But you see Craig go over and inform the captain of something. Meanwhile, Brady also returns to the scene and fills the captain in on some information. I, I like to think that John Louis was about to work up the courage to invite the captain to Blackjack and then saw Brady was like, nope, nope, <laughs> walked away. Yeah, yeah and is 22 bad? What? The, the hand, 22. <clears throat> Oh yes, that is, oh. that's a bust. Dang. I'm gonna play my, my person as kind of low key. Also kind of as like, like an excuse to not know all the rules. Yeah. So you're gonna have to tell me when I'm on the clock or when I'm off the clock, because I think that's kind of funny as like a running, <laughs> sure, running, sure, running yeah, thing. Yeah, that is good. So you deal out blackjack. You get maybe one round in. When you are interrupted by the captain's address, as he shouts out across the area, all right, you scallywags. Ship's taken a bit of a tumble, and it's a tad more slanted than we'd like. It also has no power, not, not a lick, none of it. So, while the engineers are working on getting that sorted out, we're camping out here. Don't know what planet this is, but it seems habitable enough. Enjoy your night. And he comes over to your table. <gasps> Juliet. Very bad timing. The mm. herbs are hitting. No, that's what they're supposed to do, man. And he walks over with his arms crossed, his parrot kind of preening the captain's hair a little bit. <coughs> he just looks down at what you're doing, strokes his beard. Ahoy, captain. Would you like to be dealt in? He looks directly at Rami. I hear you're the one who stopped the ship from uh, taking a worse tumble. I mean... I don't like to brag, but yeah, I like to brag. <laughs> well done. I also hear our prior pilot had a bit of an unfortunate end. Yep. Shame that. Uh, he had a... Oh yeah, he yeah. got like super stabbed and also... And poisoned. I. Hmm? And poisoned. Yeah, the spittle. Yeah. He's poisoned. Yeah. It's awful. Your spit's not blue when you just die like normal. No, it is not. Why would somebody do both? More effective. Poison the knife. Stippy stabby. Or feed him a poison, stab him to hide your tracks. I don't suppose you know someone who might have disliked the pilot. Might have had the means to stab him, to poison him. Someone who um, maybe had some blood to clean off their clothing. Ah, well, we'll figure it out. After all, we're stuck on a ship, at a dimensional space, clearly someone here is next. And he stares at all of you. Anyway, we need some parts for the ship, and 
I believe there's something on top of that mountain there. And you can't really see anything from where you are, but he seems very certain that there is <laughs> something at the summit of that specific mountain. Did you scout it out? Saw it as we were making our rapid descent. Bright beacon sorts. Usually indicate some sort of settlement, uh, power station, tower of some sorts. Anyways, here's a list and he hands a piece of paper. I'll take it. Thank you, sir. Immediately. Those are the parts we need. Aye, aye. Scout that mountain, find what's there, get the parts, bring them back. Or, you know, if you happen to find a nicer ship. We will do that. We will get you two of each. Uh, huh? Two ships? I don't need two. two ships. I need one. He's just a bit. Take a ship. Sorry. I'm Unless just... we blow up the other one. Ooh. <laughs> Rami's gonna unstrap his sniper rifle from off of his back, mm -hmm. aim it at the mountain just so he can use it as a telescope, potentially, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and see what he can see. Yeah, it's hard to see the summit from here because there are a lot of trees. You are at the bottom of the valley, there's a lot of tree cover, it's hard to see through the canopy. But you think you do see some lights up there that aren't just stars. So is there anything you want to do before you head out? Any provisions you want to get? This is a fairly tall mountain. It is going to be quite the climb if you want to get to the summit. You don't know what planet this is, you don't know what supplies you might need, what you might encounter along the way. Can we bring food? Absolutely. <laughs> cool, I want to bring food. All right. Yeah, the munchies. Yeah. You collect some rations for the trip. Is there anything else you want to do? Anyone else you want to talk to before um, we depart? I'll actually go I'll go find Craig. Yeah, sure. He is probably moping. He is being used as the go-between between the higher level engineers working on the ship and sending any messages outward. So he is just leaning against the side of the ship outside, just staring at Brady looking forlorn. Okay, um, hey, Rumi. Doesn't really work, I feel like maybe is better. Hey, maybe, um, you still sad? Life is a dance through misery. Uh-huh. <laughs> I, you know, I would have thought that this would have hit you in a kind of bittersweet kind of way, given how much shit you were talking about, Alim. What do you mean? Did you not hear what happened? Uh, the ship broke. All right. Do you mean is he getting fired for for being a ship pilot? Yeah, he's not gonna be on the crew anymore. Okay, okay, mate. But I. Do you so... think I still have a shot then? Listen. I just wanted to ask, since it seems like you were really involved with that whole situation, um, did you know anybody else who didn't like him? No. Everyone liked him. Yeah, he was the cool pilot, right? <laughs> yeah, he was the one who was just, like, really smooth and had shiny hair. Wore sunglasses indoors, yep. Yeah. He was the one that was, like, you know, not super close with anyone, but also close with everyone. <sighs> Alright, well, uh... I'll catch up with you later. Captain's got a mission for me, so uh, I don't know. Cheer up, be positive. Maybe maybe take a smaller shot, swing next time. Maybe I have a chance. He's like only half listening to you at this point. You hear shouts from inside and he looks over at you. He's like, um, yeah, good luck with whatever. Yep, good luck with your love life, such as it is. Life is meaningless and empty. Uh-huh, uh-huh. <laughs> Shuffles on inside. This is me trying to remember AFI lyrics to drop into this. Oh, God. <laughs> Can I do some kind of memory check? Maybe like a, a late notice check to re try to remember if, since I was doing the laundry, if any of the clothes had any blood on them. Mm. Yeah, let's do notice with your constitution modifier. Like to use the tower? Yes. That's an eight. Mm -hmm. It's hard to say. Because you do recall seeing some stains on some clothes that were red, mm. but was that just red wine? Was that you know, the, the cherry juice? Because it would have been only within the last few hours. 
someone likely would have dealt with that right away before the blood dried and turned brown. I think uh, I'm gonna lean into Sid probably. Just be like, um, <clears throat> hey Sid, do you remember back in 98 when One-Eyed Rob had the whole storyline where he poisoned you and then you came back into the ring and kicked yeah, his yeah, ass. Yeah, yeah. I laid into him, gave him the old uh, crown right on top of the head. Yes, of course. Yeah. And then it was outed that he got caught because his clothing had traces of the poison. That's right. I seem to recall a, a nice coat that I laundered uh, earlier today. All right. Maybe at some point when we get back to the ship, you can come with me and we can check out that coat. Could point yeah, us in the right direction. Yeah. Let's find One-Eyed Rob again, or you, you know what I mean. One-Eyed Rob, but Jackson. Yes. Yeah. Yes. All right. Keep that under your head. All right. Well, what about those two over there? I, uh, for now, you know, just keep it under your head. Okay. All right. Okay. Good luck. It'd be really cool if once we find the culprit, you did the thing again. I will. We'll see. Okay. All right. Remember, mom's the word. Mom's the word. All right. Great. I feel really good right now. Maybe it's those herbs that that beautiful Juliet gave me. Oh. You know, I know it's the fifth time this month, Sid, but I think I'm falling in love. <laughs> uh, yes, it's Craig's alter ego, apparently. <laughs> Are there any obviously carnivorous plants around? Can you roll a notice check? Yeah. Not or survive. Good. Oh, I'm better at those. That oh. uh, is an eight. You don't see any obviously carnivorous plants. Okay. You also don't see any plants whose coloring is drastically different from other plants. And you do know that coloring is often a way that plants give warnings. Yeah. In that case, Jay has nothing that she's gonna do. If she found a carnivorous plant, she would have told uh, Ishel and just been like, maybe you can use that to, to get the rats. <laughs> <laughs> you find a jungle set. <laughs> All right, we good to go? When we get this done, so then we can get back to whatever's going on with the ship. Right. Let's go, mate. And you head into the woods. A lot of people are staring after you. And then they just kind of shrug and continue what they're doing, assuming you have other orders. I'm not really thinking much of it. Brady, you do note, stares and watches you until you disappear from her sight. I'm going to telepathic contact Brady. Mm. You can get face emotions from her. She is very curious. She has a lot of thoughts going through her head, strategizing. Interesting. Yeah. Craig in the background sees this happening. It's like, my life is meaningless. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to take this one step deeper because I can do it as an instant action. I would like to just ask in her mind, why so curious? Pilot dies on my ship, why the fuck do you think I'm curious? Ah. Then here's a clue. Go check the laundry room. There might be something there that can point you in the right direction. Yeah. I'm already working on the surveillance footage of the cockpit. That's actually way better than my idea. Yeah, do you want to continue trying to tell me how to do my fucking job? No. Oh, oh, no. Hey, let Hey, Sid, sorry, uh... You're doing that weird staring thing again. <laughs> he just points at his head. <laughs> you know that, that thing we do where we talk to each other in a crowded room but no one knows we're talking? Yeah. I was doing that. Is this out loud or is this in your head? No, this is out loud. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was doing that with the first mate, which... I thought you just, guys were just checking each other out. No, 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 believe me, I don't think she wants anything to do with me, she... I meant you too. <laughs> you and Sid. You do that very frequently. Oh, no, <laughs> well, I mean, he's been my hero since I was like, yay hi. That's adorable. I have a signed poster. I don't think he remembers, but I was like seven. I'll remember. And, uh, it's just a little old. I'm gonna step over here. You remember? You remember. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go. Let's go. Oh, I thought we were walking this whole time. <laughs> Let's walk faster. Let's walk faster. With purpose. Yes. And now, Brady is that pissed off just in general with everyone. Yeah, yeah, it is yeah. not a just to you thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that, that's just how she... So you are hiking up the side of this mountain. 
and where you are is pretty dense in terms of foliage. There's lots of shrubs, there's a thick bed of dead leaves from years prior. As you continue going, there are a variety of other creatures that scatter away from you as you're just charging through these woods. Can I have all of you do a notice check, please? And for Tyler, that is 2d6. Juliet, Jay, you hear voices before anyone else does. And you see not far from you, between the trees, what looks like a, a break, like there's a path. And nobody else has noticed this. We're all just continuing on. Who's closest to me? Someone I'll be you. close to you. Perfect. Yeah. Hey, people over there. I'll sight towards them to get a better view. Yeah, so you can't really see them. It's a lot of trees in the way. Jay heard the voices and could see there's likely a path over there. Mm. You can be certain you're not alone, but you can't see who these people are yet. And you all are making a lot of noise. So, you know, I figure either we can take the path maybe run into the people, or avoid the path on purpose to avoid the people. I can take the higher ground. I think John Louis like run, uses his telekinetic traversal to run <laughs> upwards, vertically up trees, to just have a look. I guess, thanks for the backup. What, no, I, I, I'm here. I'm here for you. I can fight. I like how you climb those trees, it's real cool. Oh, thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah. Right. <laughs> if I fight, you mean Let's send go. me? Is that what you're talking about? Or are you gonna come down here and fight them too, lad? No, 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 I'm gonna jump from above. And you also start hearing a whirring sound. Do I recognize the whirring sounds? You absolutely would recognize the sound of a security drone. Hello, thank you for joining us this week. This episode was recorded in Watertown, Massachusetts, which is also known as the traditional land of the Pecoset and Nanantan peoples. As always, I want to give a huge thank you to all the musicians whose music helped bring this podcast to life, especially to Michael Yang, who wrote and produced the theme song for this miniseries. I'd also like to give a huge shout out to Rin Garnett for running this special. If you wish to know more about the world of Talos, you can do so on World Anvil. The link will be provided in the description. Other contributors were Tyler Rubin and Nikki Aguilar-Thompson. I've been your host, Alex Aguilar-Thompson, and I hope to see you again next week for another episode of Roleplay Radio. <laughs>